Hello English 1 students and welcome back to another chapter of The Great Gatsby. Today we're going to read together chapter 2. But before we do that, let's do a quick recap on what we read yesterday and what happened in chapter 1. So chapter 1 we met our narrator, who we later find out's name is Nick Carraway. What do we know about Nick? Well, we know that he comes from a very privileged background. He says so himself that um, his family was wealthy and that he knows that he has a lot of privilege in his life. And even his father recognizes that and makes sure to tell him that he should never judge somebody else because they might not have had the same good background and good upbringing that he had. We also know that he went to Yale and we know that he was in the war, that he started from World War I as a soldier. We know that he came back to live in the Midwest. We can maybe assume that he lived in Chicago, um, but we know that he, since coming back from World War I, has been kind of bored. Um, he went from a very stimulating environment, the, the fronts of the war, to being back in the Midwest. You can imagine how, how boring that might be. Um, so he says that he wants something new to entertain him, a new thrill. So for him, that new thrill comes in the way of moving to New York City and working on the stock market, which is a pretty, you can imagine, it must be a pretty thrilling experience. High stakes, um, that sort of thing, the big city, the big apple. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so when he moves to New York, he lives on Long Island Sound, which is a body of water. And he essentially lives in a bay on um, Long Island Sound. And the bay has two peninsulas sticking out into it and those two peninsulas look identical to each other and what they look like is an egg they look like they're shaped like an egg so they are called east egg and west egg he lives on west egg <clears throat> and he admits that west egg for some reason or another is the less fashionable one to live on we haven't really learned why all we know is that he says it's the less cool one to live on so he lives in a little cottage and he lives in between two mansions and one of the mansions that he lives next to um he noticed he describes in in great detail how extraordinary it is how it looks like it was modeled after these fancy castles in europe and the ivy and the marble swimming pool and all of that and we learn that his next door neighbor's last name is gadsby so we don't really know anything else about Gatsby yet, but we do know that he's obviously very important, right? Because the novel is named after him. It's named The Great Gatsby. So we know he's, he's somebody important. Um, so by chance, our, main, our narrator, Nick, has a cousin, Daisy. And Daisy just so happens to live on East Egg, like right across the bay from him. And Daisy is married to Tom Buchanan. So Nick... Our narrator knows Tom because he went to Yale with him. And when they were in college, um, he notes that Tom was the epitome of the ultimate jock. He was a football star, um, the best in the business. And really, in Nick's opinion, he was so good at being a college football player that he kind of peaked there. There wasn't really much more for him to go up from that point because he kind of that was kind of the biggest thing that could happen for him in his life. So um, he was kind of what you might think of as like stereotypical jock, like famous, um, popular jock. But not only that, Tom Buchanan is extremely rich. And he's extremely rich because his parents are extremely rich. Now we learned that Tom is just turned, he's around 30. I think he is 30, maybe he just turned 30. So we can kind of... Um, all over the characters we're dealing with, let's say they're probably in their late 20s, maybe just pushing into their 30s. Can you really imagine a 30-year-old who has worked enough or hard enough in their life to be a millionaire by the time they're 30? That's not really very common. Maybe if you're like a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs kind of guy, but even those guys were like very old when they got to be their level of where they're at. Um, so maybe Mark Zuckerberg might be the only one we could think of that got to be to that level by that age. But very unlikely for him to have done that on his own earning. So we know that he's that rich because his parents are that rich. He's inherited that money. So right there, that's kind of the establishment of one of the big themes we're going to see continuing 
throughout this story is this idea of the self-made man, the man who makes his own money, who goes out there and works hard and earns his money, versus the man who inherits money, who is born into money, the family money man. So Daisy, when she finds out that um, Nick is living in the area, who's living in New York now, she invites him to come to dinner at their house. So one evening, Nick goes to the Caraway's house. It's amazing. It's a, a fantastic mansion. He describes the the rolling yard and the horses in it and the pillars and it's you know over the top rich fancy mansion um and he goes for dinner there at Ta um, daisy and tom's and when he comes inside he also meets a woman named jordan baker who is friends with daisy and we later learn that jordan baker is also a socialite so the word socialite <clears throat> if you aren't familiar with it means somebody who is in the high status of society and they kind of are a semi-celebrity but they're not really famous they're not like you know a movie star or a rock star they're just kind of known for being social for being wealthy and going about and going to the art gallery openings and going to the parties and they're essentially just known for being wealthy and being out and about all the time. So, um, Daisy is a socialite, and we know that Jordan Baker is kind of in that echelon also, kind of in that crowd as well. But her claim to fame, how she got into that um, level of society, is that she is an athlete. She's a professional athlete. Um, she is a golfer, and she competes in um, the big golf tournaments, which is really very interesting um, to have a female athlete portrayed in this novel because this is taking place in the 1920s and as we talked about yesterday um remember women only got the right to vote in 1920 so women's equality issues are very much new at this time they're really in their infancy so it's really interesting that f scott fitzgerald decided to have a female professional athlete um which is something we kind of typically think of as a male dominated sphere. So, um, Nick, our narrator, um, is kind of into Jordan. He says that she's very attractive. Um, he kind of goes into describing her physique. He's looking her up and down, you might say. And it's interesting also to note that, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, he's the author. He's a creator. He could have created characters to look however he wanted them to look. But he chose to have Jordan be somewhat masculine looking. So her body is described as very boyish. Instead of like what you might describe as effeminate, like feminine things like curvy or soft, she is kind of sharp and straight. Um, and so that's interesting that he's portraying her that way and as an athlete and also another layer on top of that is it's interesting that nick is attracted to her in that sense but we're just gonna see where that goes um so daisy is also described a lot in this chapter uh, in chapter one we know that daisy is um for some reason she's just incredibly intoxicating um she it's like her very presence is able to really draw she she's like a siren have you guys heard of sirens before um in greek mythology the female that i think they were kind of like mermaid ish and they would be on like an island and they would sing this song that whenever passing sailors heard the song they became so entranced by the sound of the music that it it overwhelmed them and it like lured them in, it drawed them in and they couldn't help themselves. They had no self-control. They were just drawn in. And then the sirens, when they got there, they would kill them and eat them, whatever. Um, but Daisy in a sense is very similar. She's described as being like a siren. She's very um, alluring in some way. She, she, her whole presence is very charming and it's like it draws you in and it's like she's very, um, somehow she she's like that siren or like the like the venus flytrap that if you have you've taken any biology 
botany classes, you know, the Venus flytrap is a plant that looks very, very beautiful and it draws insects to it because it smells very, very sweet and it looks very beautiful. So the flies get drawn to it, but then when they get to the flytrap, they fall in and they get stuck inside the sticky liquid inside the flytrap and it's actually toxic and it um, like biodegrades them. And that's how the plant eats the flies. And in a sense, Daisy is very much like this. She She's very much able to, it's like she has a sweet aroma or she has a sweet sound coming from her. Something about her draws men in. It hasn't said anything about them, about her destroying them yet. But it's interesting that kind of what we, the kind of parallels that we can see in literature or in nature to a female that is able to draw a man in like that, like the Venus flytrap or the Greek sirens, it usually always ends in their destruction. So what kind of predictions might you make about Daisy? Do you think Daisy is going to be this way? Do you think that she has the capability to draw a man in and destroy him? Is that her agenda? Is that her purpose? What do you think is going to happen from this? We'll find out. So we got to know Daisy some. We know that her, her laugh is very um, charming. Her voice is charming. Everything about her is charming. Um, we also got to know that Tom is cheating on her. He has a mistress. He has a woman in New York City that's his side girlfriend. And we also know that Daisy seems to know about it and she's pretty upset about it. And the woman calls at dinner and it really seems to upset Daisy. <clears throat> After this, um, Daisy and Nick have a heart to heart on the porch and she tells him about, she kind of opens up to him in a strange way about how um, she's kind of had a rough go at things, but she doesn't really say how. And then he kind of tries to change the topic and he's like, oh, what about your daughter? Cause she's got a two year old daughter. And Daisy is like, you know, I honestly cried whenever I found out she was a girl. She was so upset about her being, about the baby being a girl, not a boy. And she says that she hopes that if her, you know, baby being a girl, that the only way to survive at being a girl in their world is to be a beautiful fool, quote unquote, a beautiful fool. So thinking about what you think of when you think of the word fool, somebody who, foolish, right? That's somebody who, um, who is easily tricked or who's not very smart or who doesn't really understand the <clears throat> complexity or depth of things. So it's kind of like she said, is saying that like the expression ignorance is bliss and that's the only way to get by being a woman. And so for some reason she feels that being a woman is very, very difficult. And that could possibly be because she's, you know, being constantly cheated on by her husband, but yeah. And so at the end of the chapter, Nick goes back home and when he gets home, it's it's middle of the night, it's dark out, and you know, the sky is clear, there's a moon, there's stars, and he sees in the moonlight a man outside Gatsby's house. And he's like, oh, it's Gatsby. And he thinks, oh, I'll go talk to him, I'll go meet him. Um, but Gatsby, he can tell by his body posture that he does not want to be messed with. Um, and he is standing looking out over the bay which we know on the other side of the bay is East Egg. And he's like reaching out, like wanting, like longing for something. He's staring over there. And what he seems to be staring at is a green light. So we'll look more into the, this element of the green light. That is a symbol that is really often um, analyzed when people look at the Great Gatsby. It's like, there's a couple of, there's a, few, a handful of, of symbols in this book that are like the most famously talked about symbols. Um, I'm not gonna spend much time on that because I think we can find our own important things. But the green light is one of the most commonly focused on elements of symbolism in the novel. Um, but for right now, all we know about the green light is that it's probably the light on a boat dock on the other side of the bay. And that's where chapter one ended. So now we're gonna pick up on, that was a recap, and now we're gonna pick up and read chapter two, which is much shorter than chapter one. So hopefully it won't take us quite as long, but we're still gonna stop and do some um, commentary along the way. So <clears throat> please get out your books.
The Great Gatsby, and open to chapter two. I'm not sure what page that is for you because I have a different um, copy than you do, but. <clears throat> okay, The Great Gatsby, chapter two. About halfway between West A and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile or so as to, as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is the Valley of Ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke, and finally, with a transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Occasionally, a line of gray cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak, and comes to rest. And immediately, the ash gray men swarm up with leaden spades and stir up an impenetrable cloud which screens their obscure operations from your sight so let's pause there <clears throat> what is being described here the valley of ashes a place where men are working through ashes um everything is coated in ashes it's gray it's gross the air is coated in it trains um will call will crawl up on the train track and the men start swarming and using their shovels and getting out more ash i would say this sounds like an industrial park of some time of some type probably maybe a coal mine or a coal operation somewhere where there's some sort of manufacturing happening that produces some very dirty waste some very dirty like coal or or ashes of some sort and um we if you recall from the day we we did the historical background of the 1920s, um, this was a time where people were still trying to advocate for labor rights, where we were just kind of getting the formation of unions and a lot of labor was really exploited at this time. So people who were immigrants or who were very impoverished usually ended up having to work in very dangerous and unsavory and unhealthy working conditions like a mine or um, like some sort of industrial waste place where there's lots of ashes. But in any case, all we know is that this is like a, a desolate place and the road goes right by it. You see it when you drive to New York. If you want to get to New York from, from West Egg, you have to go past this valley of ashes. And you see these men just working their life away in these gross maybe not gross, but just dangerous, like bad conditions where there's just ashes everywhere. So, but above the gray land and the spasms of bleak dust, which drift endlessly over it, you perceive after a moment, the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic. Their retinas are one yard high. They look out of no face, but instead from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles, which pass over a non-existent nose. Evidently, some wild wag of an oculist set them there to fatten his practice in the borough of Queens, and then sank down himself into eternal blindness, or forgot them, and moved away. But his eyes, dimmed a little by many paintless days under sun and rain, brood on over the solemn dumping ground. This is another of the most commonly analyzed symbols in this text. Um, and I don't know if we can say at this point what it symbolizes. I think we can come back to it when we've read further. But at this point, we can at least understand what's going on here. So he's talking about a billboard. Uh, a billboard that is for an oculist. So an oculist is what we call today an optometrist, which is an eye doctor. So he's selling glasses. So his billboard is literally just a giant pair of glasses over a giant set of eyeballs. And the eyeballs are blue and the glasses are yellow. And it says Dr. TJ Eckelberg on it. And it's an advertisement for a guy selling glasses. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have a nose and you don't have a face. It's just the eyes there. Um, but, and you've probably seen this before, sometimes people they don't care about their billboard or maybe they move away, maybe they go out of business, whatever, but you've all seen billboards that are totally like 
the sun has worn away the paint and the rain and they look bad and they're kind of faded it's kind of like that these they're actually kind of spooky like kind of ominous like this untaken care of old pair of glasses on this these eyes that are looking out this billboard is placed right over the valley of ashes and it's looking out over these men um hmm interesting <clears throat> The Valley of Ashes is bounded on one side by a small foul river, and when the drawbridge is up to let barges through, the passengers are on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as half an hour. There is always a halt there of at least a minute, and it was because of this that I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. So he's on the train, he's taking the train from West Egg to New York, and he has to go right past this Valley of Ashes. And he says that this is the reason why he's met Tom Buchanan's mistress that we know he has. The fact that he had one was insisted upon wherever he was known. Everybody says he's got a mistress. His acquaintances resented the fact that he turned up in popular restaurants with her. And leaving her at a table, sauntered about chatting with whomsoever he knew. Though I was curious to see her, I had no desire to meet her, but I did. I went up to New York with Tom on the train one afternoon, and when we stopped by the ash heaps, he jumped to his feet and, taking hold of my elbow, literally forced me from the car. What a jerk. So, not only does he have a mistress, and everybody knows that he's got a mistress, he doesn't try to be secretive about it. He doesn't try to be sly about it. He more pushes it in everybody's face, which that's what makes all his friends mad. They're not necessarily mad that he's got a side girlfriend, but they're like, hey, don't push it in everyone's faces. Like, that's so rude to Daisy. But instead, he'll take this woman out to dinner and when he and in public, and when he's out with her, he'll go and chat to all of his friends like it's no big deal, even though he's literally there cheating on Daisy. Can you believe that? What kind of person might you say that... Tom is based on this. <clears throat> so, all right. We're getting off, he insisted. I want you to meet my girl. I think he'd tanked up a good deal at lunch, and his determination to have my company bordered on violence. The supercilious assumption was that on Sunday afternoon, I had nothing better to do. I followed him over a low, whitewashed railroad fence, and we walked back a hundred yards along the road under Dr. Eckelberg's persistent stare. The only building in sight was a small block of yellow brick sitting on the edge of the wasteland, a sort of compact main street ministering to it and contiguous to absolutely nothing. One of the three shops it contained was for rent, and another was an all-night restaurant approached by a trail of ashes. The third was a garage. Repairs. George B. Wilson. Cars bought and sold, and I followed Tom inside. So, <clears throat> in at this train stop next to the Valley of Ashes, that place is desolate, and it's like it's a little... Imagine kind of like towns that used to be bigger than they are today. Um, I don't know if you can think of anything like that. I hate to say Higby, but maybe think of Higby where... Um, there used to be like kind of a main street where there was like lots of businesses on it, but now those are just kind of empty brick buildings now. And that's kind of like what this little compound is here, this kind of main street. It just has one compound, like one brick building that has three shops in it. One is empty, the other is a restaurant, and the third one is a car repair place under the name of George B. Wilson Repairs. And this is where they go inside. <clears throat> the interior was unprosperous and bare. The only car visible was the dust-covered wreck of a Ford, which crouched in a dim corner. It, ha it had occurred to me that this shadow of a garage must be a blind, and that sumptuous and romantic apartments were concealed overhead, when the proprietor himself appeared in the door of an office, wiping his hands on a piece of waste. He was a blonde, spiritless man, anemic and faintly handsome. When he saw us, a damp gleam of hope sprang into his light blue eyes. So this place is so <clears throat> falling apart that 
our narrator Nick thinks there's no way this could be a real car garage. This has to be a front for like a brothel or drugs or alcohol or something because this is, I mean, this is a pathetic excuse for a car garage, a car repair place. But then the owner comes out and is literally a mechanic and he's like, oh, dang. Um, the mechanic is described as faintly handsome, but he's also described as spiritless. So spiritless might be somebody who's kind of like depressed, kind of not full of, you know, spirit is somebody who's happy and excited. And you can kind of see their personality. Somebody who you can tell has hope and plans and determination. A spiritless person might be someone who has kind of more or less given up on life, who's let life beat them down. Um, and it's also described as anemic. So to be anemic, you may have heard of this, it's a medical term. Anemic means that you um, are kind of, you're sickly, um, you have a hard time retaining iron in your blood from meat. So a person who's anemic is often incredibly skinny and um, light, like kind of pale, translucent, um, you kind of see their veins underneath. And they're also usually very tired and sluggish. Um, so the way to me that this man is described is that he kind of seems um, kind of ghost-like like a shell of a person, not like, he's just not really full of any life. <clears throat> Hello, Wilson, old man, said Tom, slapping him jovially on the shoulder. How's business? I can't complain, answered Wilson unconvincingly. When are you going to sell me that car? Next week. I've got my man working on it now. Works pretty slow, don't he? No, he doesn't, said Tom coldly. And if you feel that way about it, maybe I'd better sell it somewhere else, after all. I don't mean that, explained Wilson quickly. I just meant... His voice faded off, and Tom glanced impatiently around the garage. Then I heard footsteps on a stairs, and in a moment, the thickish figure of a woman blocked out the light from the office door. She was in the middle thirties and faintly stout but she carried her surplus flesh sensuously as some women can. Her face above a spotted dress of dark blue crepe de chine contained no facet or gleam of beauty, but there was an immediately perceptible vitality about her as if the nerves of her body were continually smoldering. She smiled slowly and walking through her husband as if he were a ghost shook hands with Tom, looking him flush in the eye. Then she wet her lips and without turning around, spoke to her husband in a soft, coarse voice. Get some chairs, why don't you? So somebody can sit down. Oh, sure, agreed Wilson hurriedly and went toward the little office, mingling immediately with the cement color of the walls. Let's pause there. Very interesting stuff here. So we now we're seeing it. Tom's mistress. How is she described? She comes down the stairs into the garage and she's described as having a thickish figure. So she's thick. And so today, um, you know, perceptions of beauty change throughout the decades. Um, and today's conception of beauty, you know, you guys make jokes all the time. Being thick is is considered to be attractive for a woman. To be thick, you know, have the hips, be curvy, that sort of thing. Um, but maybe in the 1920s, it was probably more attractive to be very skinny and thin. And so, um, kind of like how Jordan Baker is described. But we see um, his mistress is described as having a thick figure. And she's in her middle 30s. Faintly stout. So what does stout mean? Stout means when you're kind of shorter and wider. And she, but it says that she carried her surplus f flesh sensuously as some women can. So even though she had some extra weight on her, some extra flesh, she carried it in a very sensual way. So she was able to carry it and look very attractive, look very good, even though she was kind of fat in a sense for their, their standards of fat, but she was able to carry it in a way that looked very good. 
Um, but then Nick goes, Nick goes on to talk about her face. And it says that her face doesn't have any gleam of beauty in it. There is nothing beautiful about her face. But she is incredibly attractive. Not because she's beautiful, but because there was an immediately perceptible vitality about her. As if the nerves of her body were continually smoldering. What does vitality mean? Look up vitality. Vitality means full of life. Um, have you ever seen somebody who is just so full of life that maybe they're not attractive, but they actually look attractive? People who are, are full of life are more attractive than somebody who's maybe meek and reserved. Maybe they're beautiful and pretty, but they're kind of pale and kind of eh, and they don't really want to do stuff. But a woman who is um, filled with life, with that vitality, there's something about her. It's probably a primal instinct um, because think about caveman times. Um, you would want to choose a mate who is more likely to live and who is more likely to be able to reproduce for you and have children that are going to be strong and healthy and full of life. And so that's probably why this woman, is, it's considered attractive that she's so full of life. It says it's like her nerves. So like your nerves in your body. It's like they're continuously smoldering. So smoldering is like a fire, right? It's like there's this fire inside of her that's constantly burning. Um, like, and that must, you know, to me that sounds like, wow, she must be a very attractive woman. And it says that she is. She's not beautiful at all. And she's kind of thick. She's kind of bigger. But she has this this strength, this vitality inside of her that is makes her attractive. Um, so she's described as being nearly exactly opposite of her husband, who is described as anemic and spiritless. She is full of spirit. And when she walks by her husband, it says that she. it was like she walked through him, like he was just a ghost. Um, think of the expression... You know, she walks all over him. A woman who walks all over her husband. Kind of like that. She just walks right through him. Doesn't even care about him at all. Okay. So she tells her husband to get some chairs and he, he goes. <clears throat> a white ashen dust veiled his dark suit and his pale hair as it veiled everything in the vicinity. Except his wife, who moved close to Tom. I want to see you, said Tom intently. Get on the next train. All right. I'll meet you by the newsstand on the lower level. She nodded and moved away from him just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs from his office door. We waited for her down the road and out of sight. It was a few days before the 4th of July and a gray, scrawny Italian child was setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad track. Terrible place, isn't it? said Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckelberg. Awful. It does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object? Wilson? He thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb, he doesn't know he's alive. So how, how does Tom think about... Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, I had to sneeze. Not the corona, just allergies. <clears throat> he says that Wilson is so dumb, he doesn't even know that his wife is going off to cheat on him. He thinks that she's going to go see her sister in New York. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York. Or not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. Tom deferred that much to the sensibilities of, the East, of those East Eggers who might be on the train. She had changed her dress to a brown figured muslin, which stretched tight over her rather wide hips, as Tom helped her to the platform in New York. At the newsstand, she bought a copy of Town Tattle and a moving picture magazine, and in the station drugstore, some cold cream and a small flask of perfume. Upstairs in the solemn... Sorry, I think I skipped a page. Oh, no, I didn't. <clears throat> in the solemn, echoing drive, she let four taxi cabs drive away before she selected a new one, lavender-colored with gray upholstery, and in this we slid out from the mass of the station into the glowing sunshine. But immediately, she turned sharply from the window and, leaning forward, tapped on the front glass. I want to get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I want to get one for the apartment. They're nice to have a dog. So, <clears throat> the kind of person that she is. She 
gets to New York and instantly starts spending money, probably Tom's money. She gets stuff that's totally unnecessary, unessential things, magazine, some lotion, some perfume. And when they have to travel on, she turns down four taxis before she finally picks one because she's so picky and she has to, she picks one simply based on its color. She wants to ride in the lavender, the purple colored taxi. <clears throat> and then she sees a man selling dogs on the street. And she says, I want one of those dogs. So she's kind of a consumeristic kind of person. Um, yeah, okay. We backed up to a great old man who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. In a basket swung from his neck, cowered a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. So they're like mixed, they're mutts. What kind are they? asked Mrs. Wilson eagerly as he came to the taxi, taxi window. All kinds. What kind do you want, lady? I'd like to get one of those police dogs. I don't suppose you got that kind. The man peered doubtfully into the basket, plunged in his hand, and drew one up, wriggling by the back of the neck. That's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man with disappointment in his voice. It's more of an Airedale. He passed his hand over the brown wash rag of a back. Look at that coat, some coat. That's a dog that'll never bother you with catching a cold. I think it's cute, said Mrs. Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? That dog? He looked at it admiringly. That dog will cost you $10. The Airedale, undoubtedly, there was an Airedale concerned in it somewhere, though its feet were startlingly white changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Wilson's lap, where she fondled the weatherproof coat with rapture. Is it a boy or a girl? she asked delicately. That dog, that dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. Here's your money. Go and buy ten more dogs with it. So Tom sees that this was a scam. This guy, his dog, he doesn't know what breed these dogs are. They're just mutts. And he's, he's you know, scamming this rich, rich woman who's dumb, doesn't know anything. Um, and when he pays him the $10, he's like, you can go buy 10 more dogs for that. You know, get out of here. He clearly, to Tom, he doesn't care. Even though he knows he's getting scammed, he still pays for it. Because to him, money doesn't mean anything. We drove over to Fifth Avenue, so warm and soft, almost pastoral on the sum summer Sunday afternoon, that I wouldn't have been surprised to see a great flock of white sheep turn the corner. Hold on, I said. I have to leave you here. No, you don't, interposed Tom quickly. Myrtle will be hurt if you don't come up to the apartment. Won't you, Myrtle? So right there we know that his mistress's name is Myrtle, Myrtle Wilson. Come on, she urged. I'll telephone my sister Catherine. She's said to be very beautiful by people who ought to know. Well, I'd like to, but... We went on, cutting back again over the park toward the West Hundreds. At 158th Street, the cab stopped at one slice in a long white cake of apartment houses. Throwing a regal homecoming glance around the neighborhood, Mrs. Wilson gathered up her dog and her other purchases and went haughtily in. I'm going to have the McKees come up, she announced as we rose in the elevator. And of course, I got to call up my sister too. So, not only is Tom cheating on Daisy, but he has a whole another apartment that he pays for just for him and his mistress. They have their own separate apartment. And even though it sounds like they're not there very often because Myrtle lives with her husband, um, she buys a dog for the apartment. And then they invite a bunch of people over when they first get there. The apartment was on the top floor, a small living room, a small dining room, a small bedroom, and a bath. The living room was crowded to the doors with a set of tapestried furniture, entirely too large for it, so that to move about was to stumble continually over scenes of ladies swinging in the Garden of Versailles. The only picture was an over-enlarged photograph, apparently a hen sitting on a blurred rock. Looked at from a distance, however, the hen resolved itself into a bonnet and the countenance of a stout old lady beamed down into the room. Several old copies of Town Tattle lay on the table together with a copy of Simon Called Peter and some of the small scandal magazines of Broadway. 
Mrs. Wilson was first concerned with the dog. A reluctant elevator boy went for a box full of straw and some milk to which he added, on his own initiative, a tin of large hard dog biscuits, one of which decomposed apathetically in the saucer of milk all afternoon. Meanwhile, Tom brought out a bottle of whiskey from a locked bureau door. So, their apartment. I think it's significant how it's physically described. So, the furniture, like the couch and the chairs, are all way too big for the small apartment. Like a huge overstuffed couch that is just too huge for this tiny place. So, imagine that when Myrtle was probably picking out the furniture for this place, we can see that Myrtle has these like big fantasy or these big aspirations. She wants to be this socialite. She wants to be this upper class woman. And so she wants to spend money and have things like that kind of woman would have. So when she was probably picking out furniture, she probably picked out the fanciest and the biggest couches because that's what she thinks she wants to be, but she didn't take into consideration that it was too big for the apartment. It kind of reminds me of that expression, too big for your britches. That's what it kind of seems like. Also, um, when she asks the elevator boy to go get the things that she'll need to have a dog inside, she doesn't even think to get the dog food. The elevator boy is the one who decides to get the food for the dog. What does that say about Myrtle's capacity to take care of something if she doesn't even consider the idea that the dog is going to need food. Interesting. So they settle in and Tom gets out the whiskey, which again, remember, this is prohibition era, so alcohol is illegal, but he's got some alcohol. I have been drunk just twice in my life, and the second time was that afternoon. So everything that happened has a dim, hazy cast over it, although until after 8 o'clock the apartment was full of cheerful sun. Sitting on Tom's lap, Mrs. Wilson called up several people on the telephone. Then there were no cigarettes, and I went out to buy some at the drugstore on the corner. When I came back, they had disappeared, so I sat down discre discreetly in the living room and read a chapter of Simon Called Peter. Either it was terrible stuff or the whiskey distorted things because it didn't make any sense to me. Just as Tom and Myrtle, after the first drink Mrs. Wilson and I called each other by our first names, reappeared, company commenced to arrive at the apartment door. The sister, Catherine, was a slender, worldly girl of about 30 with a solid sticky bob of red hair and a complexion powdered milky white. Her eyebrows had been plucked and then drawn on again at a more rakish angle. But the efforts of nature toward the restoration of the old alignment gave a blurred air to her face. When she moved about, there was an incessant clicking as innumerable pottery bracelets jingled up and down upon her arms. She came in with such a propriety haste and looked around so possessively at the furniture that I wondered if she lived here. But when I asked her, she laughed immoderately, repeated my question aloud, and told me she lived with a girlfriend at a hotel. Let's pause. So, first of all, girlfriend, I don't think that means that they're as a romantic girlfriend. I think she means a friend who is a girl. Secondly, we have a description of Catherine. She's slender, so she's skinny, and she um, has a bob, which is the style of the time, you know, the hair that goes like here. It's red. What's very interesting, though, is that you may have seen like old women do this where they entirely pluck out their eyebrows because they don't like the shape or whatever their eyebrows look like and then they redraw them on the fake eyebrows. That's what this woman has done. And she has redrawn them at a more rakish angle. So a rake is, well, it's a garden tool, you know, a rake to rake things. But a rake is actually also an adjective, uh, a word used to describe a man or a woman, and this is an, an old tiny vernacular, a rake is um, somebody who is very flirty and who gets around a lot. Um, and so she redraws the her eyebrows to look more flirty. It's interesting. 
but it says that her real eyebrows keep coming growing back in so it's almost like she has the line that's the fake eyebrow and then she has the line that's the real eyebrow and because you can kind of see both at the same time it makes an effect of like a blur it makes it look like her face is blurry, which is interesting, I think. I think there's some some symbolism or something to be analyzed there about her character, the way that she's described like that. Okay. Mr. McKee was a pale, feminine man from the flat below. He had just shaved, for there was a white spot of lather on his cheekbone, and he was most respectful in his greeting to everyone in the room. He informed me that he was in the artistic game, and I gathered later that he was a photographer and had made the dim enlargement of Mrs. Wilson's mother, which hovered like an ectoplasm on the wall. His wife was shrill, languid, handsome, and horrible. She told me with pride that her husband had photographed her a hundred and twenty-seven times since they had been married. So the married couple from down the flat below is over for their little party, and they are the McKees. Mrs. McKee is described as horrible. Um, she's shrill, but she's also handsome, which is an interesting word to use for a woman. Not beautiful, handsome. The husband, Mr. McKee, is also described as feminine. So in this marriage, it's like there are um, opposite genders. Um, it's the, the husband is described as being feminine, and the wife is described as being handsome. It's like a role reversal. I'm not really sure why or what the purpose of this is, but it's interesting to see that. Mrs. Wilson had changed her costume some time before and was now attired in an elaborate afternoon dress of cream-colored chiffon, which gave out a continual rustle as she swept about the room. With the influence of the dress, her personality had also undergone a change. The intense vitality that had been so remarkable in the garage was converted into impressive hauteur. Her laughter, her gestures, her assertions became more violently affected moment by moment, and as she expanded, the room grew smaller around her until she seemed to be revolving on a noisy, creaking pivot through the smoky air. So it's like her personality is just so big, it just takes over the room. My dear, she told her sister in a high, menacing shout. Most of these fellows will cheat you every time. All they think of is money. I had a woman up here last week to look at my feet, and when she gave me the bill, you'd have thought she had my appendix cut out. What was the name of the woman? asked Mrs. McKee. Mrs. Eberhardt. She goes around looking at people's feet in their homes. I like your dress, remarked Mrs. McKee. I think it's adorable. Mrs. Wilson rejected the compliment by raising her eyebrow in disdain. It's just a crazy old thing, she said. I just slip it on sometimes when I don't care what I look like. But it looks wonderful on you, if you know what I mean, pursued Mrs. McKee. If Chester could only get you in that pose, I think he could make something of it. We all looked in silence at Mrs. Wilson, who removed a strand of hair from over her eye and looked back at us with a brilliant smile. Mr. McKee regarded her intently with his head on one side and then moved his hand back and forth slowly in front of his face. So, interesting, she's, she's purposefully changed this outfit. Clearly one that she likes. Um, probably an expensive fancy dress. But then whenever the neighbor compliments her on the dress, she, uh, <laughs> this old thing, oh, this is just some cheap, ugly old thing that I throw on sometimes, but I don't care about what I look like. So, She's really quite full of herself. Um, so now the, the Mr. McKee is talking about kind of about photographing her. He's a photographer. I should change the light, he said after a moment. I'd like to bring out the modeling of the features. And I try to get hold of all the back hair. I wouldn't think of changing the light, cried Mrs. McKee. I think it's... Her husband said, shh. And we all looked at the subject again, whereupon Tom Buchanan yawned audibly and got to his feet. You McKees have something to drink, he said. Get some more ice and mineral water, Myrtle, before everyone goes to sleep. I told that boy about the ice, Myrtle raised her eyebrows in despair at the shiftlessness of the lower orders. These people, you have to keep after them all the time. She looked at me and laughed pointlessly. 
Then she flounced over to the dog, kissed it with ecstasy, and swept it into the kitchen, implying that a dozen chefs awaited her orders there. So for somebody who kind of comes from a lower class, I mean, she's married to a mechanic who works next to the Valley of Ashes, and they live there. She thinks of herself as being high class. She criticizes the elevator boy who was supposed to go get ice and never did and says you can't trust them, they're shiftless. It's interesting that she's criticizing this lower class when she's actually a part of it. She thinks of herself as being bigger or more important than what she is. I've done some nice things out on Long Island, asserted Mr. McKee. Tom looked at him blankly. Two of them we have framed downstairs. To what? demanded Tom. Two studies. One of them I call Montauk Point, the goals. And the other I call Montauk Point, the sea. The sister Catherine sat down beside me on the couch. Do you live on Long Island too? She inquired. I live at West Egg. Really? I was down there at a party about a month ago. And a man named Gadsby's. Do you know him? So now we have time back to Gadsby, the character of Gadsby. I live next door to him. Well, they say he's a nephew or a cousin of Kaiser Wilhelm's. That's where all his money comes from. Really? She nodded. I'm scared of him. I'd hate to have him get anything on me. The absorbing, this absorbing information about my neighbor was interrupted by Mrs. McKee's pointing suddenly at Catherine. Chester, I think you could do something with her, she broke out. But Mr. McKee only nodded in a bored way and turned his attention to Tom. So, who is Kaiser Wilhelm? You should look that up. I am not exactly sure, actually. I'm uh, assuming he is a important political figure in probably Germany. And the fact that um, this rumor that Gadsby is related to him is both impressive and scary. And also accounts for how Gadsby has so much money. But it's just a rumor. And you can be look up who that is and let me know. <clears throat> I'd like to do more work on Long Island if I could get the entry. All I ask is that they should give me a start. Ask Myrtle, said Tom, breaking into a short shot of laughter as Mrs. Wilson entered with a tray. She'll give you a letter of introduction, won't you, Myrtle? Do what? she asked, startled. You'll give Mr. McKee a letter of introduction to your husband so he can do some studies of him. His lips moved silently for a moment as he invented George B. Wilson at the gasoline pump or something like that. So, um, Tom is using the photographer neighbor, Mr. McKee, to make fun of Myrtle's husband and says that he could be the next study of his photography. George B. Wilson at the gas pump. Catherine leaned close to me and whispered in my ear. Neither of them can stand the person they're married to. Can't they? Can't stand them. She looked at Myrtle and then at Tom. What I say is, why go on living with them if they can't stand them? If I was them, I'd get a divorce and get married to each other right away. Doesn't she like Wilson either? The answer to this was unexpected. It came from Myrtle, who had overheard the question, and it was violent and obscene. You see, cried Catherine triumphantly. She lowered her voice again. It's really his wife that's keeping them apart. She's a Catholic and they don't believe in divorce. Daisy was not a Catholic and I was a little shocked at the elaborateness of the lie. When they do get married, continued Catherine, they're going west to live for a while until it blows over. It'd be more discreet to go to Europe. So Myrtle's sister thinks that and again, so she's, her perspective comes from Myrtle. So she doesn't really actually know how Tom feels. But according to Myrtle, both Myrtle and Tom hate their spouses so much. And the only reason why they aren't married to each other is because Tom can't divorce Daisy because she's Catholic. And if you know anything about Catholic, especially Catholics in older times, um, divorce is like absolutely unacceptable. So... Um, that's the excuse they have here. Well, Tom can't get divorced because Daisy's Catholic. But Nick, as Daisy's cousin, knows that's not true. Daisy is not Catholic. So it's interesting that that's like this rumor that's going around. But 
Catherine is convinced that eventually they're both going to get divorced from their spouses and then they'll marry each other. How likely do you really think that is? That sounds more like something that a person who's a cheater tells their side girlfriend to kind of keep them hanging on. <clears throat> oh, do you like Europe? She exclaimed surprisingly. I just got back from Monte Carlo. Really? Just last year. I went over there with another girl. Stay long? No, we just went to Monte Carlo and back. We went by way of Marseille. We had over $1,200 when we started, but we got gypped out of it all in two days in the private rooms. We had an awful time getting back, I can tell you. God, how I hated that town. The late afternoon sky bloomed in the window for a moment like the blue honey of the Mediterranean. Then the shrill voice of Mrs. McKee called me into the room. I almost made a mistake, too, she declared vigorously. I almost married a little kike who'd been after me for years. I knew he was below me. Everybody kept saying to me, Lucille, that man's way below you. But if I hadn't met Chester, he'd have got me sure. So I'm going to pause there for a second. I read that word because it's in the book. But that is not a word that I would ever say otherwise and that I wouldn't want any of you guys to ever say. That word is a derogatory word used for a Jewish person. It's almost the equivalent of the N-word, but for a Jewish person. So, again, I read it because it's in the text, and I've been reading some other curse words because they're in the text, but um, I absolutely do not want you guys to say that word outside of reading this book. Um, but it's significant also here in the text. So, because she's using that derogatory word to describe a Jewish person, we know that how she feels about Jewish people. So it's a racist thing. So we have some racism here um, presented against um, Jewish people. Yes, but listen, said Myrtle Wilson, nodding her head up and down. At least you didn't marry him. I know I didn't. Well, I married him, said Myrtle ambiguously. And that's the difference between your case and mine. Why did you, Myrtle? demanded Catherine. Nobody forced you to. Myrtle considered. I married him because I thought he was a gentleman, she said finally. I thought he knew something about breeding, but he wasn't fit to lick my shoe. You were crazy about him for a while, said Catherine. Crazy about him, cried Myrtle incredulously. Who said I was crazy about him? I never was any more crazy about him than I was about that man there. She pointed suddenly at me, and everyone looked at me accusingly. I tried to show by my expression that I had played no part in her past. So, she's describing why she married her husband, George Wilson. That she thought he was good, had some good breeding, but when she actually got to know him, he wasn't fit to lick her shoe, as she says. The only crazy I was when I, the only crazy I was, was when I married him. I knew right away I had made a mistake. He borrowed somebody's best suit to get married in and never even told me about it. And the man came after it one day when he was out. She looked around to see who was listening. Oh, is that your suit? I said. This is the first I ever heard about it. But I gave it to him and then I laid down and cried to the beat, to beat the band all afternoon. So she was upset because he was too poor to have his own suit. So he borrowed one and didn't tell her that he was that poor. Is that something that would bother you guys? Is it, is she upset here about the fact that he's poor or about the fact that he didn't tell her he was poor? I don't know. She really ought to get away from him, resumed Catherine to me. They've been living over that garage for 11 years and Tom's the first sweetie she ever had. The bottle of whiskey, a second one, was now in constant demand by all present, except in Catherine who, felt just as good on nothing at all. Tom rang for the janitor and sent him for some celebrated sandwiches, which were a complete supper in themselves. I wanted to get out and walk eastward toward the park through the soft twilight, but each time I tried to go, I became entangled in some wild strident argument which pulled me back, as if with ropes, into my chair. Yet, however the city, our line of yellow windows must have contributed their share of human secrecy to the casual watcher in the darkening streets. And I was him, too, looking up and wondering. I was within and without, 
simultaneously enchanted and repelled by the inexhaustible variety of life. Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever felt like you are, you're there and you're in and you're involved in the conversation, but at the same time, you're kind of like an outsider, like you're outside of it. And it's almost like you're an outsider looking in. Like maybe you don't feel like you belong or you're not part of it. That's kind of how Nick is describing he feels right now. Myrtle pull, pulled her chair close to mine and suddenly her warm breath poured over me the story of her first meeting with Tom. It was on the two little seats facing each other that are always the last ones left on the train. I was going up to New York to see my sister and spend the night. He had on a dress suit and patent leather shoes and I couldn't keep my eyes off him. But every time he looked at me, I had to pretend to be looking at the advertisement over his head. When we came into the station, he was next to me and his white shirt front pressed against my arm. And so I told him I'd have to call a policeman, but he knew I lied. I was so excited that when I got into a taxi with him, I didn't hardly know I was getting into a subway train. All I kept thinking about over and over was, you can't live forever, you can't live forever. Kind of the equivalent of YOLO, you only live once, so why not do something crazy and reckless because YOLO. That's essentially what she was saying. She turned to, to Mrs. McKee and the room rang full of her artificial laughter. My dear, she cried, I'm going to give you this dress as soon as I'm through with it. I've got to get another one tomorrow. I'm going to make a list of all the things I've got to get. A massage and a wave and a collar for the dog and one of those cute little ashtrays where you touch a spring and a wreath with a black silk bow from Mother's Grave that'll last all summer. I've got to write down a list so I won't forget all the things I got to do. So all the things that she has to get, none of them are things she has to get. A massage, a new dress, a bow, like none of these things are things, an ashtray. She doesn't need any of those things, but she's making it sound like she has to go get them. So she clearly loves to spend money and it seems like it's probably Tom's money that she's spending and loves to spend. And she likes to make it, it sound like she is um, a high roller by saying, oh dear, to her neighbor, you can just have this dress once I'm finished, then oh, I'm gonna get another one. It was nine o'clock. Almost immediately afterwards, I looked at my watch and found it was 10. Mr. McKee was asleep on a chair with his fist clenched in his lap, like a, photo like a photograph of a man in action. Taking out my handkerchief, I wiped from his cheek the remains of the spot of dried lather that had worried me all afternoon. The little dog was sitting on the table with blind eyes through the smoke and from time to time groaning faintly. People disappeared, reappeared, made plans to go somewhere, and then lost each other, searched for each other, found each other a few feet away. Sometime toward, toward midnight, Tom Buchanan and Mrs. Wilson stood face to face, discussing in impassioned voices whether Mrs. Wilson had any right to mention Daisy's name. Daisy, Daisy, Daisy! shouted Mrs. Wilson. I'll say it whenever I want to. Daisy, day, making a short, deft movement, Tom Buchanan broke her nose with his open hand. So they're fighting over whether his mistress has any right to say his wife's name. She keeps saying it and he slaps her across the face or punches her or whatever, breaking her nose. Then there was bloody towels upon the bathroom floor and women's voices scolding and high over the confusion, a long, broken wail of pain. Mr. McKee awoke from his doze and started in a daze toward the door. When he had gone halfway, he turned around and stared at the scene, his wife and Catherine scolding and consoling as they stumbled here and there among the crowded furniture with articles of aid, and then despairing figure on the couch bleeding fluently and trying to spread a copy of Town Tattle over the tapestry scenes of Versailles. Then Mr. McKee turned and continued on out the door. Taking my hat from the chandelier, I followed. Come to lunch some day, he suggested as we groaned down the elevator. Where? Anywhere. Keep your hands off the lever, snapped the elevator boy. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. All right, I agreed. I'll be glad to. So, the fight scene between Myrtle and Tom in their apartment. And all the commotion after that, they're trying to clean up the blood, trying to, you know, Mrs. McKee and Catherine are trying to comfort Myrtle. And all this commotion, Mr. McKee is like, you know, peace out, I'm out. So he gets up to leave. When he gets up to leave, our narrator, Nick, also gets up to leave, follows him out. 
all right, fine, they're getting out, they're getting away from the drama. When they're out, Mr. McKee says to Nick, hey, why don't you come to lunch sometime? And anywhere you want. And he's like, so Nick's like, okay. Seems, um, you know, fine, like, right, you know, like, nice enough, right? Just kind of normal, normal enough. But then, the next line starts off with dot, dot, dot. That's the only time we see a sentence start with dot, dot, dot. What does dot, dot, dot mean? We know it's an ellipses, but what does it mean? It usually means that some information is being left out. So what information is being left out here? There's a dot, dot, dot between them leaving together, dot, dot, dot. And then we see the next thing says, I was standing beside his bed and he was sitting up between the sheets clad in his underwear with a great portfolio in his hands. What happened here? They leave the apartment together. Dot, dot, dot. The next scene, Nick, the narrator, is standing next to Mr. McKee beside his bed, and he's sitting, Mr. McKee is sitting in his bed in his underwear. I'm not saying that something happened here. There's no, you know, proof that something happened here. But to me, it seems like something maybe happened here. Maybe Nick is gay. Because Mr. McKee was described earlier as being feminine, which is a stereotypical description or stereotypically how a gay man is often described. And Nick also was attracted to Jordan Baker, who is a woman who was described as being kind of masculine. Not saying this is the, the truth or what it is, but it's a possibility to consider. Beauty and the Beast, Loneliness, Old Grocery Horse, Broken Bridge. He's describing his pictures. Then I was lying half asleep in the cold lower level of the Pennsylvania station, staring at the morning tribune and waiting for the four o'clock train. The end of chapter two. Quite an ending. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed chapter two of The Great Gatsby. Let me know if there's anything you don't understand, anything you want to discuss more, any ideas you're having. And please also check out the video I posted earlier on how to do the close reading worksheets in your worksheet packet. And I will post again soon with chapter three. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye.